Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the Riverwood Conservancy's webinar, How to Protect Our Bird Population with Isabel Savransky. My name is Stephanie. I'm the Community Program Coordinator at the Riverwood Conservancy. I hope you are all doing well and enjoying the beautiful weather. I wanna say a special thanks to Credit Valley Conservation for supporting all of the work that we do. And before we get started, I just want to mention that all of our July programs are now live on our website. Please register for as many programs as you would like. On your screen now, you should see an entire event calendar for our virtual and in-person events for July. Anything highlighted in yellow are programs that are coming up and are open to join. We are easing our way back into in-person events that adhere to public health guidelines and we'll be offering outdoor yoga, meditation and forest bathing events through July to September. Spaces are limited, so please register for as many sessions as you would like at the riverworldconservancy.org slash events. And this is a last reminder if you're interested in our nature photography course with Dave Taylor to sign up on our website as it begins this evening at 7 p.m. and runs through the month of July. And if you would like to support our programs and conservation of Riverwood's habitat and wildlife, please consider donating on our website. We greatly appreciate any small contribution to make a difference. And before we get to our wonderful speaker today, the Riverwood Conservancy would like to acknowledge that the land on which we operate is the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional homeland of the Anishinaabe, Wendat, and Haudenosaunee Nations. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, this place is still home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people, and we are so grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. And today, we have Isabel Savransky, who is a recent graduate from the University of Guelph, where she studies animal biology. Isabel works as a wildlife rehabilitator and became involved with Bird Safe Guelph when she wanted to learn more about protecting birds from deadly window collisions. So welcome, Isabel. We also have a TRC volunteer with us today, Sarah, who will be helping us out this afternoon. So thank you, Sarah, as well for joining us. And if you have any questions during the presentation for Isabel, please type them in the chat, Q&A, or comment section, and we will address them at the end of the presentation. So Isabel, I will hand it over to you. Thanks so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to do this presentation. So I'm just gonna share my screen and get started on the presentation. Can you see it? Yes, you can. Okay, perfect. So BirdSafe Guelph is a team of students, staff, and faculty based out of the University of Guelph who are dedicated to creating environments that help local birds survive and thrive. The Guelph Bird Safe Window Initiative aims to educate and engage the Guelph community in action towards bird conservation by providing community members with educational material and kits to transform their windows at home to be bird safe. So a little bit more of an introduction about myself. My name is Isabel. I have worked at a wildlife center for the past four years, working with many different mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and birds. I also just recently graduated from the University of Guelph, where I studied animal, biologies for, animal biology for the past four years. And the reason I joined BirdSafe Guelph in my fourth year was because I became, during the pandemic, I found myself being out in nature more and getting more interested in the species of birds around me. So I started, you know, getting a little bit more into birding. And after I learned about the birds, I wanted to learn how I could help them. And so I found this organization that was working to retrofit all the buildings at the University of Guelph in order to prevent fatal bird collisions. So I usually do this presentation with another member of Bird Safe Guelph and her name is Alessandra. And this is her story of a time she found an injured bird. So I'm just gonna tell her story and explain the backstory behind it. So she was visiting Chicago when she found this Virginia rail 
just out on the street. It looked like it had suffered from some sort of collision. And then you normally wouldn't think you would find such a strange bird in the city because their natural habitat are wetlands. So she was really surprised about it. And that's kind of how she started to learn more about bird window collisions and made her passionate about educating others about what can happen to birds in big cities like this. So in order to educate you on bird window collisions, I feel like I need to share a little bit more about bird migration patterns so that you understand why they happen in order to work on how we can prevent it. So migration happens twice a year. You'll see in the spring and in the fall, lots of flocks of various different types of birds. Lots of tropical birds are coming up north because that's where they breed and that's where they can find more resources and they don't have to fight for a small amount of food as they would if they stayed and didn't migrate. So migration is great because it allows birds, you know, to help populations thrive, but every single bird po experiences a risk because, you know, they're doing a lot of traveling, it's very long distances that they're going, there's a lot of predation, and then the topic of today that we're going to be talking about is bird window collisions specifically. So here's an image of a red-tailed hawk. You can clearly see that he is confused by the glass window. And on the right is a red-tailed hawk that seemingly looks like it was injured. And so similarly to the rail that I was showing you in the big city from Chicago, the explanation is windows. So windows are very awful for birds because in the daylight, birds can't actually see that it is a window and you can't fly through it. So they just assume they can keep going, fly through it. And that is how these collisions can happen. So they see a reflections of vegetation. For example, like you would see all this greenery reflect and you would just, the bird just assumes they can fly through. And this obviously ends in debil debilitating injuries or intense disorientation that could be fatal for the bird later. So a lot of working at a wildlife center, a lot of the things I personally witnessed from bird window collisions, um, birds get fractures, some of them can be healed, some of them cannot be healed. Um, they get head injuries, they face neurological issues, or sometimes they're just stunned. And if they're stunned for a long period of time, they're not getting food, water, and overall they can die as well. And so another issue that is also important to consider with these tall buildings and cities is light pollution. So obviously in the winter it gets dark at six and humans still want to, you know, do things at six, which is why we use light. But the issue is that light also attracts birds and thus causes more window strikes. And because there's also nocturnal migratory birds that only fly at night, they're more likely to be subjected to light pollution during migration, which is a critical part of the annual cycle for many species. So these are two really big issues that birds that fly through big cities and they need to fly through these big cities because that is their migration pattern. For example, Toronto is right in the middle of the migration pattern of many, many birds. So that is why this is an issue. And so another thing I want to note is that just the sheer amount of deaths that have happened due to these buildings. And this is important because in the past 50 years, North America has lost over 3 billion birds mainly due to human-related causes. In Canada alone, an estimated 25 million birds are killed in window collisions each year, with collisions primarily occurring at houses and low-rise buildings. So even if you live in a two-story townhouse, some birds do fly at that level and they, it still poses a risk. So it's not always just the huge condos in Toronto that are causing this. Um, it could be smaller houses, as well as including universities, in all types of buildings. Specifically, universities have been identified as one of the most problematic building sectors for fatal window collisions out of all low-rise buildings in Canada. And for specifically to Guelph, members of BirdSafe Guelph have actually witnessed while they were studying in certain buildings on campus, they have seen birds just hit the window and die, which is very upsetting, obviously. Another factor of bird deaths that is a little bit concerning is outdoor cats and development. So with the continuation of global urbanization, it's likely that the number of bird fatalities will 
continue to rise unless action is taken. Bird window collisions can be prevented by transforming window panes to be more visible to birds. As land use changes to support the growing demands of increasing populations, or as urban areas continue to expand, more natural areas will become fragmented or broken up. They'll be further apart and it will be more difficult for birds to get from one place to another. These natural areas are heavily relied on by birds as well as their food, uh, their food sources and possible predators. Native species are at a higher risk of population decline due to decreased worst resources, increased competition, and vulnerability to invasive species, species such as cats, which are not natural predators, predators, but still cause a lot of harm to the bird populations. So to add to the detrimental impact that artificial light sources and windows have on bird populations, we've got a really complicated problem on our hands. It seems like these birds are putting in so much work to get from one place to another and they face so many risks, it can be really troubling for their population. And I know I just gave you a lot of really sad and upsetting facts, but we're going to talk about how we can improve these things um, and how we can do better for the bird population. So our team, in the past few years, two students by the name of Shelby Bone and Alex Sutton in the Integrative Biology Department at the University of Guelph, started conversations with the department about retrofitting windows on campus after they experienced many different birds hitting the Summerlee Science Complex while they were working inside. This was a huge endeavor and they made some progress, but with just two of them, they didn't have enough power to convince the university to take action. The aim of this initiative was to teach community members about the issue of bird window collisions and start for forming a community of bird people who demonstrate that they care about avian conservation. Ultimately, we wish to continue working towards helping the University of Guelph and the City of Guelph become a bird safe campus and city. In short, it started with a group of individuals with a passion for avian conservation. And after this, uh, Haley Wilson, who's also She's right there. She took action and started the organization, which is now known as Bird Safe Wealth. And together they work to fundraise and educate others about bird collisions and how we can mitigate them on campus and in the city of Wealth. So they've made informative pamphlets, they've done fundraising, and I'll show you more of what they've done. But uh, as a team, we're just overall working to retrofit and change the policies on campus, as well as just promote that within the community. And although this is an organization that is specific to Guelph, there's many bird organizations, whether they're, you know, focusing directly on retrofitting windows, you can look into in your area just to see if anyone is interested in forming some sort of organization like this as well. So what do we do? So as I mentioned, there's the window retrofitting within the campus as well as the community. So in downtown Guelph, there are some buildings that we have done fundraisers for where we've drawn on them and we just want to promote more bird safe windows overall in the city of Guelph. We're working on research. Many of the students uh, that are part of this organization are doing PhDs or masters and doing research within avian conservation. So that is a part of it as well. And community engagement and fundraising. So something that we did was we fundraised to give free window kits to people within the city of Guelph. And we did that through making postcards. I think there was a photographer who took really pretty nature shots of birds and we sold those as postcards and we generated money that way. And so overall the initiative aims to engage the city of Guelph in education and action toward local bird conservation by providing community members with the knowledge and materials to retrofit their windows to be bird safe. And there's a couple different ways you can make your windows bird safe and I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, and then we also have a lot of really amazing contributors that we have had the help of luckily. So Wild Birds Unlimited is a shop that we were selling our kits out and giving them out from. It is a bird seed shop in Guelph. And then we also have WWF and Nature Canada and lots of other organizations. Feather Friendly is actually the organization that makes the specific bird window kit. So if you were interested in just buying one for your own house or your condo or to gift to someone, that's where you can buy it. And then FLAP is an organization that 
Working at the Wildlife Center, I have actually worked a lot with. Uh, it stands for Fatal Light Awareness Program. Um, and basically, they just are volunteers that find birds that have um, experienced a collision or just birds that look stunned or died in the city of uh, Toronto mainly. And so if they think the birds can be saved, they bring them to the Wildlife Center and we re rehabilitate them. Um, and they just collect a lot of data and research about birds that have faced these collisions. And so things that if you are interested and after hearing all this, you're inspired and you want to, you know, be bird safe, here are some ways you can get involved. So as I mentioned, Flap Canada is a volunteer based organization, so you can reach out to them and see if you can be a volunteer for them. Um, another thing is, as I mentioned, cats. If you have pet cats, it's always a good idea to keep them indoors as they are not natural predators and they kill lots and lots of birds every year. So if you want to take your cat outside, there's lots of great options like leashes or even like outdoor cat mansion cages. Like kind of hard to explain, but they're just kind of like big cages that you keep your cat in and they can still experience the world outside but without harming any birds. Um, some other ways are, obviously, if you're interested and if you're in the city of Guelph, you can join Bird Save Guelph and be a volunteer or be a member. And then doing bird um, collision mapping is also done by volunteers. So lots of really great organizations that you can be a part of. And if you've ever heard of eBird, which is an app that you can track bird sightings, that's also really valuable to research as well as I, there's a link here to, if you look up 10 ways to help birds from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, it talks about different ways from, you know, plastic pollution and using monitoring apps and volunteering, lots of different ways you can help there. So if you just go plug that into Google, there's a lot of great tips there as well. And so to get a little bit more about how windows should be retrofitted, um, maybe before you've seen noticed windows like this, or maybe you've seen windows like this, and I just want to put it out there that these are actually not appropriately retrofitted. So the issue here is both of the images, the decals are too far apart, they're spaced far apart, which means that birds will still potentially mistake them as just, you know, they can fly through. And so they don't actually, they're proven to not prevent collisions, unfortunately. And so what we do instead, um, we've done oil paintings with like oil-based markers. And you can see that all of the images and the drawings are fairly closely like together, which means it's filling up the whole window and birds are less likely to crash into it. And then there's also this one. This one is actually proven to be the, more, the most effective one. This is the one from Feather Friendly, the organization I, I mentioned before. And so they can be found on windows of condominiums, schools, and all types of different buildings that are both residential and commercial. And these little dots are actually, I believe, five to six centimeters maximum spread apart. So there is a specific measurement that you have to put them up. Um, and they are the most uh, effective way of preventing bird window collisions. So in short, rather than having like 15 decals of birds that are not really spaced out consistently, like there's a lot of gaps there and it's just not proven to not be effective. If you are going to go the decal way, you can do this and you can buy, it's like a big sheet that you buy from Feather Friendly. Or you can just use an oil-based marker and as long as, it'll be a tedious task, but you could just measure out five to six centimeters um, apart and that will make it bird safe. Um, and then I have a quick video of someone from the Bird Safe organization and this is her making her window bird safe with drawings and markers. And yes, I just confirmed it's four to five centimeters, not five to six. So that is the correct measurement. And this, you could do like a really cute drawing on the outside. Um, and if you ever want to like redo it, you can always just wash it off. All right. And that is pretty much it that I have about Birdsafe Wealth. I also just wanted to 
mention that if you are interested in reaching out to Bird Safe Guelph, I have our Instagram, our Twitter, as well as our email. So if you have any questions about you want to get involved or any questions about birds and bird window collisions, you can reach out to any of these following um, handles. So thank you so much for listening. Awesome. Thank you so much, Isabel. Um, yeah, so if anyone has any questions right now, you can post them in the Q&A tab or the comment section if you're watching on Zoom or the comment section on Facebook as well. Maybe if you have any questions on how you can um, retrofit your own apartment or house building. Um, I have noticed that those little dots are all over Toronto. So I'm wondering, like, is that an initiative by a specific organization that that started to happen? Or is that a um, requirement now for Toronto um, buildings? Like, I'm just curious, do you know... Um, I'm not sure, but I would assume that whoever owns that property is the person that gets like the final say in having that. So maybe with newer construction, they are being more aware of things like that. Um, I do know I visited, for example, York University before, and they have lots of those, which is great. So I think like institutions working towards um, adding them and buildings and like just if you're building something new, just automatically having that, I think is a really good idea. Right, yeah, there's a lot of buildings now in Toronto that have that, so um, that's really, really great to hear. I was I was suspecting that it's probably something to do with birds, but I, I wasn't quite sure, um, so that's really cool. We do have one question in the Q&A tab. Um, they're asking, are there any plantings or food sources we can provide to make the environment more hospitable for birds? It's a great question. Yeah, that is a really great question. And I think the best thing you can do is actually planting native plants. So if you're thinking of starting up a garden in your backyard, make sure to do your research to figure out what plants are native to you, which will be great for pollinators. It'll be great for all types of birds, even the mammals in your area. Like if you plant a native tree, trees are have been proven to decrease the temperature of the ground around them. So on hot days like today, it's great for any kind of wildlife. So just make sure to do your research about native plants. And um, if you're mowing your lawn, actually this is a fun fact, like lots of people like to have, you know, the clean grass um, and just like no weeds, but weeds are actually, some of them are really good. If you didn't know, bunnies eat dandelion, like the, the weeds that you see everywhere. So the more natural, the better, I think. That's great. Yeah, we've, um, another thing we tried to suggest too is um, a lot of people in the fall when flowers and their gardens are no longer looking pristine, they cut them all the way to the bottom and then there's nothing left. But that's like really good food resources for birds and also migratory birds like having a place to land in your garden on top of those flowers that have all these seeds on them. It's super important. So just leaving your garden is another really great way I've heard too. Yeah, and also if you are like pruning your backyard and you're just getting rid of large branches, um, this is a plug to like my other job as a, at the Toronto Wildlife Center, you can actually donate like greenery because we use it as enrichment for any kind of like birds, mammals, raccoons, everything. So if you're ever like have a lot of branches or even pine cones, like baby raccoons really like pine cones. So <laughs> you can always look at your local rehab center and you can donate that stuff or compost it. That works too. That's awesome. Uh, another question coming in here. I work in a heritage building and we aren't able to alter the windows. Are there any particularly low impact methods that don't involve actually attaching anything to the windows? I've seen solutions that look like hanging string. Are those effective? Um, I personally have not seen the hanging string, I, but my guess would be it's not very effective because it has just been shown that these tiny dots are the best thing. Um, if you're unable to make any changes at all to the building, probably the best thing you can do is just to try and keep the lights off um, between the hours of like in the summer, I'd say maybe 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. because that is time uh, like migration for nocturnal birds. So if you can't do anything to your window, I think the least you could do is just try to keep it dark so that they don't mistake it for, um, you know, that they're able to fly through it. Right. 
And Isabel, uh, when we turn the, the lights off, do are the birds able to distinguish that that's a window because the lights are off? Do they see like a reflection? Like what is it that actually causes them to be able to yeah, I think, so I think they're just attracted to light. Like, like if they see a lot of light, it can be difficult to orient, like to just orient, orient. I don't know what word I'm trying to say, but it's yeah. difficult to like go around buildings when there's all this light coming at you, especially if you think of a condo with like, I don't know how many suites, over a thousand and all of them, the lights are on. It can be difficult to see, I think for them. So it's just been shown that, you know, turning lights off has helped them reduce migrate successfully. Right. And someone in the chat, Francine, has said probably flap has a lot to do with the building windows in Toronto. So the dots on all the, the windows. Yeah. And I've actually heard of um, a couple people that have volunteered for them before. Um, and I'm wondering, it's it's just as easy as getting in contact with them to volunteer. And, and do you just do walk, walk arounds in Toronto to see if you found bird fatalities? From the people that I know that have volunteered for it, I think you just walk around for like three to five hours or however long I guess your shift is. Yeah. Um, and you just walk the streets and look for birds. And I'm curious um, if anyone watching right now has ever found like an injured bird that they think might have hit a window, let us know in the comments because that's always interesting to see. And that actually spikes up another question in me. Sorry, I have so many questions. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering, uh, we get a lot of comments from people that have found maybe like a fledgling bird that um, uh, has just fledged the nest, but they know they can't fly yet. So people are concerned that this bird is injured. And a lot of times is what they do is they take them in their house or they bring them to a wildlife rehabber. Like I'm wondering how do you um, distinguish the two, like determine whether it's actually injured or if it's just a new fledgling bird that is just slowly finding its way. Yeah, that is a great question because we get a lot of calls about that and sometimes people do bring birds that are perfectly fine. They have nothing wrong with them. They're just like a silly juvenile bird. Um, so the biggest difference is, uh, I don't know, for example, let's just use robins. We see robins everywhere. Mm -hmm. A robin, an adult, is just very sleek looking, very prominent red colors. And then if you were to look at a picture of a juvenile, they're kind of silly looking, like they're a little fluffier, they're smaller, and you'll see their wings, they do kind of like a little hop, and so they're not able to fly yet. Um, if it was an adult that was injured, you would see probably like a wing droop, or it would probably just carry its wings differently and it would still be really scared of you but I think a juvenile might not be as scared of you and just acting a little bit sillier and making probably like they make they have a call when they're younger that is just kind of like a squawk um, if you're unsure though it's always a good idea to just call your rehab center before bringing it in um, I know a lot of my friends have reached out to me and they're like, this bird looks injured, what I do? And the best thing you can do is just leave it alone. Yeah. Um, the mom is probably nearby. If you want to, if you have like 30 minutes to just monitor and see that the mom is feeding it, that is a good idea because baby birds need to be fed like every 15 minutes. So if she's there, she will probably, you know, make a lot of noise and feed her baby. So that's the best way. Um, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, uh, do you have a number of a rehab center for us to call in Mississauga, Isabel? Um, well, I think the closest one to Mississauga would be the Toronto Wildlife Center. I don't actually know off the top of my head our like hotline number, but um, there is, uh, I think it's like a map of all the wildlife rehabilitation centers in Ontario. I think if you just look up like wildlife rescue, mm -hmm. um, or if you just look up Toronto Wildlife Center, there will be a phone number on the website. And that would be probably the closest one to Mississauga. Yeah, that's probably a great idea. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's, yeah, I, I think it must be uh, Toronto Wildlife. Um, yeah, we get, we get animals from Mississauga quite a fair bit. Right, that's awesome. Um, Last question for you. Uh, in terms of cats, and I don't want to get on the bad side of any cat lovers out there. Oh, and Sarah just put in the chat the um, website for the Toronto Wildlife Center. Thanks, Sarah. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, people um, that have outdoor cats are very passionate about having outdoor cats. I'm wondering how we can um, 
help bird populations in our own backyards? Like, what is your thoughts on bird feeders? Is that um, attracting a lot of birds to one area? Is that a risk for if your neighbor has a cat? <laughs> Um, it is, it is a hard topic to talk about. I think, um, in the winter and early spring when there's not a lot of natural food for birds, I think I would agree with bird feeders because, um, the birds in the area would probably benefit from it. And as long as you're not like feeding them from your hand, you're not, as long as it's far away enough from your house as well, where the birds are still acting normally and not approaching you or like flying to you. Um, I think that's fine. In terms of if you have a neighbor with a cat and you have a bird feeder, I think the cat would be a bigger issue than just having a bird feeder that attracts birds. And I just actually saw on Twitter today, it was a, another, I think it was Blue Ridge Wildlife Center somewhere in the United States, and they posted a picture of all the dead like animals they had from uh, I think just June, that were obvious cat attacks. And so I, I love cats. Like I am a big fan of cats and I think it, they're a great animal to have. However, I think similarly to how we wouldn't let like our off, like we wouldn't let our dogs just roam out in the streets because we'd be nervous about them, right? You don't want to do the same for your cat because if um, a bird is killed by a cat, that food source is not actually benefiting the cat. The cat has food at home. Whereas if like a hawk ate a bird, that's part of the ecosystem, part of the food system, it's benefiting the hawk. So I think the best thing you can do is like what I suggested. If you wanna take your cat outside, I think leashes are great. I love when I see cats on leashes. I think it's the cutest thing ever. Or if you don't, your cat is not leash trained, if you don't wanna get like the outdoor cage kind of integrated thing, um, the best thing you can do is probably monitor your cat, make sure that, you know, it's not killing wildlife because it's not natural. And there's actually someone at the University of Guelph that is doing research on cat behavior when they're kind of just let go. And so I think it's interest, It's going to be interesting to see, like, they put cameras on the cats and you just kind of see what the cats do all day. I think that'll be really influential research to learn what our cats do when we just lose sight of them and let them out. Right. Yeah. I don't think a lot of people understand how, how much of an impact their one singular cat is having mm -hmm. because there's a lot of cats that are roaming the streets, right? Um, yeah. And that equals a lot of birds. So, um, yeah. It, yeah. Speaking of cats, I was actually, I live close to a highway and I was coming off of like the off ramp the other day and there was a cat on the side of the road and I was like, this is so dangerous, like just for the cat. And so for the safety of your cat and the wildlife, I think it would just be best to keep a closer eye on it. Yes. And I was actually walking downtown the, uh, yesterday, last night, and there was a cat on a leash. And someone came oh, on their front so porch cute. and there was a cat on the leash. And I was like, great job. <laughs> You're awesome. <laughs> I think that's actually rising in popularity now. Like it's yeah. getting normalized and I love it. I think like if we take our dogs out for walks, why can't we just take our cats out too? Yeah. It just makes so much sense. Exactly. Exactly. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Isabel. That was a great presentation. Um, and I hope we see more of you on site or virtually at Riverwood. And thank you, Sarah, as well for volunteering and helping uh, this afternoon. It has been such a pleasure. And if anyone has any more questions, they can email me um, and we can get you in contact with Isabel and uh, Bird Safe Wealth as well. So, uh, do you have any final uh, comments, Isabel, before we say goodbye? Uh, I'm just very thankful for this opportunity. I love talking about wildlife and animals. It's like my passion in life. So I really appreciate everyone for your questions and just listening to me talk. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Oh, wonderful. Okay, well, thank you so much, everyone. And everyone have a great week ahead. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.